podcast is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a senior librarian and a woman interested in working at the library. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Um, I'm interested in doing some work for the library. Are you the person to speak to? Yes. Right. Well, um, what sort of work are you interested in? Well, I've just come to live here in Australia. I don't want a full-time job until my children have settled down, but I really need to get out of the house a bit. And I heard you need voluntary workers for various projects. Right. But I don't know if I have the right skills. Well, we do provide training. Oh. We always include an orientation to the library, together with emergency procedures. That's fire regulations, emergency exits, first aid so you can cope with accidents or sudden illness. Things like that which are necessary for anyone who's working with the public. Then we give specialist training for particular projects, like using our database system. I do have quite good computer skills, in fact. Oh, great. Is there any sort of uh, dress requirement? Well, all staff have to wear a name badge so they can be identified if they go outside the staff-only areas. But apart from that, there aren't many regulations. We ask you to sign in and sign out for insurance purposes, but that's all. How about transport? Do you live locally? Well, not too far away. I'm at Porpoise Beach. My husband needs a car during the day, but it's only about 20 minutes on the bus. In fact, we can reimburse part of your travel expenses in that case. Oh! Would that be the same if I came by car? No, uh, because parking is such a problem here. One thing we are looking for, though, is someone who can drive a minibus. No problem. So, do the projects involve going outside the library? Some, yes, but not all. We've just finished one which involved working with photographs taken of the area 50 or 100 years ago. It basically involved what we call encapsulation. Putting them in some sort of covers to keep them safe? Exactly. <laughs> it's time-consuming work and we were very grateful to have help with it. Then, sometime next year, we're hoping to begin working on an initiative involving the sorting and labelling of objects relating to local history. We'll be needing help with the cataloguing. Well, I'd definitely be interested. How about at present? Well, we have a small team who work to support those who are unable to read. Working with the blind? Yes, or other groups who have reading difficulties. We provide volunteers with equipment so that they can take books home with them and read them aloud onto CDs. We're gradually building up a collection that can be lent to those who need them. Hmm, I can see it would be useful, but I'd really like to do some sort of work where I can get the chance to meet people. How about reading stories to children? Mm, that's done by our regular staff. But we do have another project. It's a very long established scheme which involves helping those who are unable to have direct access to the library. Oh, I noticed someone with a trolley of books when I was at the hospital last week. That sort of thing. That would have been one of ours, yes. It's one of our most popular services. Lots of people who wouldn't dream of going to the library normally or when they're at home borrow a book when the trolley comes round the ward. I can imagine. Mm. Yes, I'd definitely be interested in that. Right, so how do I enrol? 
Well, we do ask all volunteers to commit themselves to a regular period each week. I could probably do five or six hours. Oh, be careful not to take on too much. But we do need someone for a couple of afternoons from two to four, so four hours altogether. That sounds fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Right. So here's the application form. It asks the usual questions: name and address, and telephone number. You also need to fill in details of who we should get in touch with in case of any accident or problem like that.、Uh, we do need to have that filled in. And there's a space for date of birth, but that's only if you're over seventy-five. So、uh, we won't worry about that. No. <laughs> oh, it asks for qualifications. Do I need to provide certificates? They're not necessary. We'll need the names of two referees, not relatives or family members, obviously.、Uh, what else? Signature of parent or guardian. <laughs> That won't be necessary, as I assume you're over eighteen. <laughs> yes. <laughs>、uh, what's this? It says civil conviction check. That's a document we have to provide by law for those working on projects involving children. So we won't need it in your case, but you will need to sign this separate document. That's a, a copy of commitment. It's basically an agreement to work according to the library guidelines. So if you'd like to fill this all in, you can do it here or take it home, whichever you prefer. I'll take it home if that's okay. Right. Well, thank you for your time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a radio program on the process of making beer. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Hello and welcome to Gourmet Evening. And this week we're looking at the world's popular beverage, a great favourite today, beer. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Clark Maxwell. Beer is one of my personal favourite beverages, and I've got a number of facts, tips, and trivia about beer to share with you. So, who invented beer and when? What is beer made of? Actually, historians are not entirely sure when beer was invented, but they guess that beer was created accidentally by early nomadic tribes roughly ten thousand years ago. The four primary ingredients are malt, hops, yeast, and water. Malt, which gives the beer a sweet taste, is made from barley soaked in water until its husks open and sprout. The sprouts are then dried and crushed. The small flowers of the hops vine are added partly because they taste bitter, helping balance the sweetness of the malt. Hops prevent the growth of bacteria that can spoil beer. Yeast is responsible for fermentation, which creates the alcohol and carbonation. Beer makers sometimes use additives or substitutes for malt or hops. 
Substitutes such as corn or rice can make a beer lighter or cheaper to produce. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Adding fruit gives beer a fruity taste. Beer is not high in alcohol, as we know. The lowest type, light beer, contains no more than 2% alcohol, and the highest may reach 6%. Other drinks, such as wine, are more alcoholic. Wine contains 8 to 20% alcohol. But that is not to say drinking beer is no danger at all. Like all alcoholic beverages, beer can make it difficult to drive and think clearly. Excessive drinking can also lead to liver damage, high blood pressure, stomach ulcers, and other health problems. However, beer also helps prevent some health problems when consumed in moderation. Beer contains a moderate number of vitamins and minerals. Studies have shown that small amounts of alcohol can reduce the risk of heart disease. Beer also contains selenium, a mineral that promotes bone growth and helps reduce the risk of osteoporosis. I suppose many of you think beer can give you a beer belly, but you are mistaken. Genes determine how fat is deposited. No food or drink can create fat deposits in specific areas of the body. As with all foods, the more calories you consume, the more likely they are to be stored as fat and cause weight gain. Beer contains no fat and averages 150 calories per serving. Well, one more thing. Pay attention to the storage and containers of beer. They will affect its taste. It's a mistake that the taste of beer improves with age, like that of some wines. Beer is a food product that will eventually become stale. It should be stored in a cool, dark location before consumption. And the color of a bottle can influence the flavor. Brown bottles block out light that reacts with the hops, which could damage the flavour. Green or clear bottles provide little or no protection from light damage. Do you know which country drinks the most beer? Although Britain is even on the list of big consumers, actually the Czech Republic consumes the most beer, at 156 litres per person per year, followed by Ireland and Germany. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation on rivers. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Please tell me about the current state of the Amazon. We have increased deforestation, increased human population relating to deforestation, and a role of fire in the Amazon on a scale that's never been seen in history. At the same time, you can see progress in trying to counter that negative trend. How do you see this? We see this in the creation of national parks and indigenous areas, and efforts to fund sustainable development activities for locals. We see both good and the bad, and it's going to be a race to finish. I understand that you started the Minimum Critical Size of Ecosystems project. Could you tell me about it? 
A number of years ago, it became apparent that those practicing conservationists didn't have the scientific information available to properly design a conservation area. They didn't know how big it had to be, right? People were learning that as forests fragment, the fragments begin to shed species after they become isolated, so they end up becoming poor examples of what they had been. This relates to the size of the fragment. Do people still study this? Yes, there is a rich subfield of conservation biology that looks at the efforts of fragmentation. One of the consequences is a general policy response to set up protected areas that are fairly large, something on the order of 1,000 square kilometers. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. Can you talk a little bit more about the forest fragmentation? As habitats are destroyed, they are accompanied by habitat fragmentation. So when 50% of a forest is lost, the remaining 50% being is not one large block, but smaller pieces, which makes the conservation problem even worse than saying that 50% has been lost. And this affects not just forest, but species diversity, correct? In terms of species loss, we can't give you precise numbers about how many species are lost because of these fragmented landscapes. But we're beginning to get close to where we can make that estimation. And so one of the policy responses to all of this, beyond just trying to create large protected areas, is to try and reconnect the fragments. You've been active in many projects studying the Amazon region over the years. Can you tell us about that process of understanding the Amazon? When people first started looking at conservation priorities, there was not much information about the geography of plant and animal species. One of the first clues was an analysis done in 1969. This looked at bird species and found geographic clusters of species which occurred nowhere else and those are priority areas for conservation. Was this when people began prioritising refuges? Yes, it was the first time that someone looked basin-wide at priorities, giving priority to so-called refugee areas. Was this when the new trend to use geographic information systems, or a GIS, started? That was in 1990 after we worked out a whole set of biological and conservational priorities and produced a big map using GIS. What are some of the things that GIS does? Well, there are several advantages of using a geographic information system. First, you can continually update the system so that it's now a constantly changing picture. You can actually watch changes. Then you can include large amounts of data including information about the vectors of development. Roads, railroads, pipelines, hydroelectric projects, etc. And finally, because it is accessible on the internet, it makes this information available to anyone who's interested. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today I'm going to talk about the city of Barcelona and its architecture. First, the city. Barcelona is a city of some one and a half million people. It is a port situated on the northeast coast of Spain in the province of Catalonia. The people speak Catalan as their native language, but most are also fluent in Castilian Spanish and some speak English too. The city centre is surrounded by a ring road which encloses a grid with two major roads running diagonally across it. These are the Avenidas Diagonal and Meridiana. Probably the most famous street in Barcelona is La Rambla, which connects the Placa de Catalunya in the town centre to the statue of Columbus on the water's edge. All along the centre of this wide boulevard are stalls selling flowers and artistic works. Barcelona was founded by the Carthaginians from modern-day Tunisia in North Africa. It grew under the influence of the Roman Empire, later becoming the capital of Spain. Under strong government, it expanded its trade, exporting cloth to other Mediterranean ports and establishing itself as a financial centre. It went into decline after 1400, and in 1640 it was the centre of the Catalan Revolution against King Philip IV of Spain. Now it is considered by many to be the cultural centre of Spain, and the Olympic Games were held there in 1992. Now to the architecture. Throughout the city there are many fine buildings, churches, cathedrals, markets and squares, which date back to the 13th century. One very fine square, which can be entered from La Rambla, is the Placa Real, or Royal Square. This was built by Molina in the 19th century. Seven narrow passages lead into a large central area, which is surrounded by two-storey buildings. Most of the ground floor is occupied by restaurants and bars, and it is traditionally a place of music and entertainment. It is impossible to talk about the architecture of Barcelona without mentioning Gaudi, who dominated the scene from the 1880s until his death in 1926. His style was unique, a decorative form of Art Nouveau, the style of the 1920s and 30s in Europe. It was based on organic natural forms, which often seem to defy the qualities of the materials they are made from. I will mention just three of his best-known works today. The first is Guell Palace. This was built for the Count of Guell, one of Gaudi's main supporters. The building features two arched gates, which lead into the stable area. Inside are two circular staircases, one for people and the other for horses. The ground floor is built of brick, but there is also much natural stone used in the construction. The roof is quite fantastic, with brightly coloured sculptures built around the chimneys and ventilation shafts. Another project commissioned by Guell is the park named after him. This was meant to be a garden city with 50 houses, but in fact only two were ever finished. The influence of nature is strong in the cave-like spaces and animal figures, and again, much use has been made of brilliantly coloured surfaces. But the greatest of Gaudi's works is still under construction, and it is not expected to be finished until 2041. He began work on this cathedral, known as La Sagrada Familia, Church of the Holy Family, in 1882, which means that it will have taken 159 years to complete. The finished building will have 18 towers, the highest being 170 metres high. The building will be 95 metres long by 60 metres wide, and it will hold 13,000 people, a truly impressive monument to Gaudi's great genius. And that's all we have time for today. Next week, we'll look at some of Gaudi's smaller projects and also his furniture designs. Please make sure that you complete your assignment on Le Corbusier by this coming Friday. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.